What's the deal, buddy? It is C. Will back here with another video, and today we're going to go back in time and look at the 1970 Alabama 500 at Talladega, and I'm looking forward to this. We're going to be looking at footage from this race. I'll also be sharing some information with y'all, some stats about this race. This was the race 10 of 48 in the 1970 season, and this was the second race at Talladega for the NASCAR Cup Series. So let's go ahead and dive right into this. Before we get started in today's video, I have some very important news I'd like to share with y'all. I am now offering memberships on my channel. If you're interested, check out the link in the description below. All right, so I uh, can't see his car for a second, but there he is. Bobby Isaac, he had won the pole for this race, and he would go on to win the championship this year. That's not where the start finish line is, it's farther that way. It's farther towards turn one. They must have used that for a Daytona diagram too or something, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's like two a couple stories, I believe two stories tall. Is the banking at Talladega? Then it was called Alabama International, I believe. International uh, Alabama International Speedway or Raceway. And there's Bobby Allison there in the 22 Dodge Daytona, um, one of my favorite uh, cars of all time in NASCAR. And this was the 10th race of the 1970 season. They had 48 races this year. And they're also showing this. They got some die casts, but bigger size die casts, like a 124 scale. Pearson didn't run as many races in 1970 as you'd think. If you watch some of my uh, videos I've done in the 1970 season, I, I talked about that. Well, one other interesting thing, um, the, the Bobby's obviously racing, but Donnie Allison wasn't in this race. Same thing with Leroy Yarborough, which surprised me because both of them used to run a lot on the super speedways. So Isaac is off pit road now. Yeah, another lead change. There's Allison in. Obviously, back then, the pit stops were longer. And they also had more men over the wall, too. You can, now you only have a certain amount you could have over the wall. It's kind of stupid uh, rule that they made, in my opinion, at least. But I can sort of see some of the reason why, because of safety, but at the same time, like, it, it just didn't make sense to me why they would put a limit on how many men could go over the wall um, to assess and work on a car. Yep, here he comes off pit road. Here's David Pearson in. So we're getting close to the end of this race. Oh, Allison just going backwards or something. He must have had a mechanical issue. Um, and he's trying to go back. Oh, the yellow's out again. Real major mechanical problem. His pit crew frantically looking down there. Huh. The yellow light is on. I think he just killed the engine. All right, so wow, look at this shot of the backstretch too. And this one that stands on the backstretch of, uh, you know, banking, dirt banking. Um, 
That was a cool camera shot. I really like that. And there's a Kelly Arborough behind Buddy Baker. And we might just be able to get a timing on one lap for Buddy Baker just to see how he's cruising now. Unofficially, we've got him about three. Another cool camera angle there. You see Pete Hamilton's working his way up to the front. We got Isaac Pearson Yarbrough behind Buddy Baker. Buddy Baker, he actually was the first to. Av I, they, that's what they say was the first to average a 200 mile per hour lap at Talladega. He was driving the 88 Dodge Daytona when he did that. Okay, so some of these cars are actually a lap down. I didn't even realize that. Then again, I'm not really surprised that some of the, the, the commentators are, are being confused so far through this broadcast because the first race, if you know, the 1969 Talladega race, they didn't know what they were like. They The scores were having such a hard time determining who was where, and they had a scoring error. Um, that's what they say, you know, and uh, the win was Richard Brickhouse, but at the same time, there's a lot of... Reasoning for why people would think Jim Vanderveer won that, but um, I would not be surprised if there was a scoring error in this race either. I like this uh, lap seconds counter here. Down the leaderboard, and then again, it's it's the night. It's 1970, so they still have a long way to go with technology. But this is really cool footage, I will say, and. Uh, I believe this is the first ABC live broadcast um, of a NASCAR race since 1960 when they did the Daytona qualifying races. The other ABC Wild World Sports broadcast they had was uh, was basically uh, either reruns or, yeah, it was, it was basically reruns, but, yeah, 50.1, that's just over, uh, yeah, they said it right there. It's sl definitely slower than the qualifying time, but still pretty fast for considering um, the point of the race that they're in now. That's such a cool shot. I love these cars so much. <laughs> oh, I did not know that. There's Pete Hamilton. He'd won the Daytona 500. If you haven't seen my video I did on that, go check that out. That was JD McDuffie just flew by. Oh, we're getting down to tw only 27 to go here. Yeah, Baker's just in a league of his own, and this one thing that wasn't uncommon about super speedways at this time was you just pull away so far from everybody else after, you know, a lot of the field had already been taken out of the race, and I wonder what they're going to talk about here. There's been a growing concern over aerodynamics in automobiles. Let's take a quick look here at a couple of diagrams. Oh, this is cool. They're showing the different, some of the different cars at the track that day. At the Dodge Daytona, play super, absolutely goaded. The Mercury Cyclones were really cool as well, and then also like the the Ford Torino Talladegas or the Ford Talladegas. And they have a small spoiler here on the front of their sharp pointed nose. Now this little spoiler right here, at speeds in excess of 150 miles an hour, can mean up to 300 pounds of additional pressure on the front of the car to keep it down. A tremendous pocket of pressure builds up right here on the windscreen. 
It breaks off, the air flows over the top of the car. Then this spoiler comes into play, putting pressure on the rear wheel. Now, this wing, which is actually made like an inverted aircraft wing, tilted at one and a half degrees at 150 plus miles an hour can mean up to 400 pounds of pressure wow. on the rear or I didn't even know that. wheels of the car. Now, the Ford's and Mercury spoiling system is a little bit different. They have this tiny thing up here in front that again takes the air in. It does two things. It cools for one thing and then holds the nose of the car down. You break up the pressure pocket here. It flows over the roof of the car. And now you have a very tiny little spoiler back here in comparison yeah, to the Yeah, the, the difference is crazy. actually interrupts the consistent flow of air. And at 180 miles an hour, if you didn't have something here to break up the flow of air, this portion of the car actually could create a vacuum from the airflow and lift it up. But because of the spoiler, the pressure is reversed or inverted and puts down onto the rear wheels, giving solid driving traction to the automobile. And we have a All right, so Baker is coming in the pit. This should be his final pit stop here. He's pretty much got this one. The, the, well, he had it in the bag, but Pete was closing on him, and, you know, it depends on how fast Pete's crew is or the petty crew is for Pete Hamilton and... Raz, yeah, look at this stop for Baker. This is not a fast stop at all. This is a long time. It's like half a lap. Yeah, more than half a lap. He's losing a lot of ground here on pit road. Basically almost a full lap on pit road. So that is going to put him pretty far back. <laughs> All right, going to another break. Oh, and we're back, and Baker has lost control and spun out. I believe this is, yep, going to turn one. Seems to be a fire, too. And he's crawling out of the passenger side. Yeah, he definitely, uh, there's definitely some flames there. Yeah, he's very dejected. He, uh, he, he had a good race going. He led the most laps. He led over a hundred laps, I believe, and now he's out of the race. Well, it is now All right, so we're coming up on the restart here. We got Bobby Isaac, P. Hamilton, Petty, Yarborough, Freddie Fryer, and Yarborough is still out there. Yarborough had to get his windshield fixed because um, a fan had thrown. I remember reading about this before. A fan had thrown. A beer bottle on the back stretch and it hit his window open near the center part of the windshield and uh, basically he had to he had to drive for a few laps without the windshield and then they had to put it back on because he couldn't breathe so that's an interesting story that I've read about this race and he still ended up finishing in the top five too very tough driver Isaac, I would assume you would think he would be on the lead lap, um, but he actually was, you know, he's on the tail end of the lead lap, and he's not the leader, it's Pete Hamilton. Hmm. And for those who don't know, I, I mentioned Freddie Fryer. He actually was driving the 14 car in this race, the 14 Dodge Daytona or Plymouth. No, it's the Plymouth. It was the 14 Plymouth. And uh, usually, and usually people think that it was just Richard Brickhouse and Rainbow Scott that drove that car, but actually Freddie Fryer t took some time driving that car as well. Looks like he's got this one in the bag as long as he doesn't do anything here. And now we will see who gets the check. Maybe that see, the announcers don't even know who's who's leading the race. It's, it's crazy, bro. There was a lot of scoring errors back then. But then again, they didn't have electronic comment scoring like nowadays. So I'm sure a lot of people are confused about the finishes and stuff. There's the white flag, so there it is. Pete Hamilton got it. Second crew win for Pete Hamilton. And he ended up winning the the second race at Talladega that year as well. So those were his three wins were around the super speedways. The second real big one for him. He was a rather surprise winner. 
in the Daytona 500 in February at the Daytona International Speedway. So basically, he he ended up uh, he ended up winning by almost a whole lap over Bobby Isaac, and then uh, you know Pearson was in the top five. Uh, Benny Parsons ended up finishing fourth, I believe, and Kel Yarbrough fifth. All right, well that's gonna do it. So if y'all remember in the video, Bobby Allison ended up uh, going backwards. Um, after he left pit road, it turns out he had engine trouble and he ended up finishing 29th. Um, he only completed 127 laps, but he did lead 40. He looked like he was going to be a contender to win the race, but he ended up going out with engine trouble. Some other drivers that went out with engine trouble, Richard Brickhouse was one of them. Charlie Glotzback as well. Glotzback was down the number 99 Dodge Daytona. He went out with engine trouble. Now, some of y'all were probably wondering what happened to Buddy Baker's car. What, what caused him to spin and catch on fire? Well, basically, there was a problem. He ran over a piece of rubber after his tire blew. And it went into his oil coolant. And then from the oil coolant, the oil went onto his exhaust pipes, if I'm correct. And that is what caused him to catch, that's what caused his car to catch on fire and him to spin out of control. The final caution was for Baker with just over 10 laps to go. He still ended up finishing 12th and he led 101 of the 188 laps that day. So the race ended up lasting 3 hours, 16 minutes, and 59 seconds. The average speed was 152 miles per hour. There was 32 lead changes among eight drivers, 40 cars in the race. There were six cautions. And some other notables I want to mention, Richard Petty finished 7th, minus 7 laps down. He did not have a great day. Freddie Fryer, as I mentioned, he was driving the 14 car, finished 6th, minus 6 laps down. James Hilton was 8th, minus 8 laps down. Neil Castles was 9th, minus 9 laps down. Dave Marcus was 17th, minus 20 laps. John Sears, driving the 86 Dodge Daytona, was 19th, minus 21 laps down. And Wendell Scott finished 20th, minus 23 laps down. Well, that's going to do it for another video. I hope y'all enjoyed. And if you did, please hit the like button. Please subscribe. And turn on this notification so you know each and every time I upload. And until next time, I'm out. Peace.